talked about uh, links between uh, Scotland and the UAE, the future, uh, what we can learn from the past, uh, and uh, it's a pretty immersive uh, idea. So um, just uh, in uh, running from left to right, um, we have Enzo, uh, who is the head of food security and creating the Crystal Crystal's global impact. And so leading global strategies of food security and decarbonizing in Edwards. And we're also joined by Paul Paxton, who's the founder of Elevation Sustainable Building Solutions. And um, so we've run in Sustainable Beacon Consulting for uh, 20 years. So uh, you can tell that Enlake, everyone who knows anything about uh, construction sustainable solutions comes to you and let it be requested. So uh, that's what I've done. Uh, and finally, delighted to be joined by Joel Saab, who's the director of sustainability. Yeah, uh, any of you who are in the UAE will learn to serve well. It's a huge group, and and the drills are leading that that he's going to drive up sizing what student facilities across the UAE. And um, I'll be particularly biased, but in my first uh, job that I genuinely got was in waste and additional waste, and I've been wildly obsessed with it ever since. Any time I get a chance to talk about uh, waste uh, efficiency or something. Energy to make any of those things well either. So I'm very glad to bring us to the distinguished panel. And we're going to move into questions. I've got a whole heap of them, so I will run through my questions. <laughs> but I've been very sad uh, no one in the audience have any questions for our panelists. So uh, don't make this the, uh, the Ruben show of questions. So it will just go on and on. Please uh, do think up your own questions, and then we can bring you in after I've uh, had a chance to pick the brains to the panelists. Um, I want to talk about the envisions of it. Paul, I was going to come to you first. Are you okay to paint a picture for me of the future I'm going to claim if what we're seeing currently evolves and the current practice is gain more prominence in your industry? Yes, of course. Uh, that's a big projection question. Um, who is it that's seen this to what's been happening uh, so far? So, in this region specifically, we have been rebuilding regulations for many years now. There's been a lot of fantastic progress in terms of sustainability. What's kind of been lacking is a way to really uh, help start designing our buildings, designing our real estate uh, from the get go, the energy and carbon front and centre. Uh, we've been kind of tracking things in a, in a relativistic sense. And what I mean by that is the way we calculate success is being, say, for example, our new building is supposed to be ten percent or fifty percent more efficient than perhaps what a notional baseline building would have be based on some uh, sort of support requirements. The way I think things will transform is as we are designing new buildings or even refurbishing new ones, we will start to have specific energy and carbon targets in mind. So similar to how you will buy a car and you will now get told uh, what the MPG is for that car. Buildings will have very specific energy and carbon performance criteria, and those will link in to uh, overall global national carbon budgets, which we'll have to work to based on the main space targets, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, wherever we're thinking we're going to end up. So that's the kind of transformation which I would like to see and which I would expect to see, because I can't see us achieving our net zero goal unless we start to move to that absolute energy and carbon and such. Fantastic. Okay, that could have a whole conversation around regulation and its role well in the industry. But we will move on and introduce the others first before we go down that, that rabbit hole. So, uh, Joel, I was going to come to you that thinking particularly around um, where it's further from innovation in that space. Um, how are you incorporating innovative waste management solutions uh, into your strategies? And what do you think? Uh, with has really exciting technologies to that. What do you think about the role of future technologies in West End? Yeah. I'll start answering the second of your question first. I think we cannot have a sustainable waste management and it's without technology and without innovation. It's impossible. Those plans been in this part of the world for over 88 years now and we couldn't have possibly made it if we weren't incorporating technologies and innovation throughout three years. Um, and uh, it's really a crucial part of our strategy. In fact, as we do and you know, develop our strategies and review them, we keep in mind that we have to be better today than we are yesterday. And there is no way to be better without 
uh, involving new technologies and innovations. So I'll give you a few examples of what we do and now um, um, and throughout the process of waste management. Uh, we have softwares that um, analyze data and allow us to optimize our collection uh, routes so that we can reduce our emissions and uh, carbon footprint. We have enhanced sorting technologies in our facilities, recycling and treatment facilities, and some of them have AI that allow us to be efficient in our process. And we deploy sometimes smart bins uh, that uh, monitor stream levels of the link to avoid unnecessary connection. So these are just few examples where we use technologies to overcome the challenges of uh, waste management, but also to minimize our environmental impact on shaping a sustainable future. There are so many technologies out there, obviously hard to live also with that, so that's a fix. Um, <laughs> and again, it's that, how do you pick the right technologies that could be the next uh, line pressing? I mean, we're going to come to Enzo, though. So, Enzo, um, I, I got the, I was, uh, had the pleasure of visiting one of those facilities yesterday, and I walked around it with my mouth agape the entire time. So there's probably photos and media where I'm not really very professional, which then is just in awe of what they are achieving. The ambition and creativity that you're sharing. So, uh, hats off, hats off to you. Um, can I ask you, to, in the context to, of your of that work or of your wine work, how are you contributing or coming up with solutions that ensure food security, given what we're seeing in our climate change, population growth, and warm pressures of the system? How are you doing things? So, hello, everybody. Um, we at Refarm, and so Google called Google with one of our partners, this is Key Enterprises, on CGI. We are focusing on interconnecting technologies for the field of food security and agriculture. And by that, we are using organ waste to one new technologies and as well biological products that represent reduced here in the lab. So uh, within this, we have a farm next to the eye in Mulgam. It's a desert farm, and actually we created uh, a forest by using these products made of waste, mostly organic waste. So we have a, an organic waste to value technology, it's the that source of life, larvae, which is converting our waste into water, um, nutrients, proteins, or animal feed, and as well organic um, compost. So. Yes, we have six technologies that are interconnected, and you're very welcome to visit us. Do it, and do it. Go and, go and see it in, in real life, because it brings it, it rings life. Uh, are they really delicious? It's not pretty, so the truth is delicious. Um, okay, but that, we're going to keep, uh, keep circling around, so I'm going to come back to you for um, thinking about sort of sustainable property development. Um, what Sustainable practices are being integrated into the current and future development project. We talked a lot about data and the investigations from the companies. Um, what do you think are the same of these practices that are minimize environmental impact and promote resilience? So, this is the very essence of why elevation was great to the year ago, right here in the UAE. So, bringing a piece of Scotland and some engineering expertise from uh, from Lazo out here and in, developing in. The LPN, uh, Mazar City. So what we see is that um, more and more data, as you've mentioned, is, is becoming critical. We're, we're finding ways now that we can access building data, which we wouldn't have been able to access before, or let's say another rate hasn't really been valued before the, the way it should be. Buildings have very uh, a lot of control systems in place. You can look around this room that we're in right now. One of these pieces of equipment you see in the ceiling is consuming energy. It's being controlled, it's being monitored, uh, the temperature control, there's variable um, air speeds coming out, there's different cooling parameters. What we're able to do now is we're able to install Internet of Things sensors in new buildings or even existing buildings. We're able to tell the story of how buildings have been performing and we're able to review what's called big data. We're able to review it now, understand why buildings have been using uh, the energy that they've been using and think about ways that perhaps was that correct. And that's really where we're trying to get to. 
after a year you use x kilowatt hours of electricity you emitted x tons of carbon is that the right number that's where we're trying to get to because there is an answer to that and in, in the new analytical uh, methodologies that we're able to build in at the design and the operational stage are the way to start to log that so really it is a big data question it's able to have engineering insights to understand the story of the data and help clients understand how much energy should you be using, what opportunities have they got to reduce it, and working through uh, the door sense of going down that. What that helps us all do it is say for here we are just now, we've got, uh, got carbon emissions of whatever it may be, but by the year 2050 that needs to be, let's say, zero for argument's sake. Um, and, and that's the plan. We'll tweet it on. The other thing here, net zero buildings are becoming more and more um, more and more commercially viable. Mazda City are developing a lot of net zero buildings. They just announced the uh, first net zero commercial office. They also announced a net zero mosque under the development that will be uh, delivered in the next uh, one to two years. How are they being done? Well, again, we're using data for simulating buildings from the very, very start, the very concept stage. We're defining how much energy that building should be using in an ideal scenario. And then we're working with designers and the contractors to make sure that that energy case, that energy story, is being uh, told all the way through all the various stages, making sure that what's delivered at the end meets the very specific requirements. We're sizing renewables and to do. So the technology is already in existence, the data is in existence, it's a case of, it's a case of using it and then delivering on targets. Uh, and then in integrating that data into usable yes. literature. So, okay, fantastic, brilliant. Uh, I do have to you. Um, so, so thinking beyond, we talked about some of the innovations in the site claim, uh, and then, um, we move beyond traditional recycling methods. So what are the other novel technologies, innovation, um, that's been used in waste reduction or in resource conservation? What do you see as the trends in that area in the industry? Um, I think currently what we are focusing on is uh, turning and treating the material that can not be recycled into an alternative fuel and providing it to the cement industry so that they can use it as an alternative to coal, reducing again the emissions. So the alternative fuel is made out of waste that uh, would usually go to landfill. So I think this is a really important um, topic that we're focusing on now. But also, unlike what people think, we don't encourage people to generate more waste so that we can collect more waste and then make more money. We, uh, on the contrary, we have a lot of educational program uh, that um, reiterate on the importance of waste reduction and the reuse and re reduce um, because we're in, in, in a society that really consumes a lot of uh, product and therefore generate a lot of waste and we shouldn't be generating it to start with. So we are, um, we've launched a line of product called the, the New Old and Reloved that repurposes some of the bulky waste that used to go to landfill into um, upcycled furniture and decorative items. You can see that in the sixth floor, I mean, this public in the cafe and that. So um, we're really trying to conserve resources as much as possible and provide solutions to give alternative for those who cannot watch use these resources such as cement industries. Fantastic. Uh, so invitation already from Edison's facilities and now invitation about the upstairs, the uh, interesting innovation. Uh, with I'll, I'll talk a little bit about measuring impact uh, of this because as Vila was talking about Rewashing as a you know, spicy subject. And I think what some of the companies we got is they make sure we can have credible clips that are demonstrable, demonstrable uh, and that would be absolutely crucial to, to us going forward. Uh, as I was going to continue and ask, ask you about um, methodologies, frameworks, how would you measure your environmental and, and social impact? Um, and, and with the data science, like, was saying, um, um, and sometimes it's really hard, so I realize I'm putting you on the spot, but, but how do you measure it? Actually, you through, through our technologies, so on one side we have IGS, so we have the and we have so we are getting a lot of big data and saving a lot of big data by producing food and as well trees and plants 
to regreen, for example, locally in the desert. So in this, in this process, we can gain a lot of data on one side. And it's the triple, I would say that um, the triple bottom line metrics as well the one health metrics. So there are a lot of possibilities to gain uh, data out of, um, I would say as well, when you work with farmers and, and stakeholders and clients, they are giving you the, the information as well. So by using sensors, 24 seven, real data, this is very comparable with science data as well, and you can combine this quite easily. Is easy, right? Easy. Yeah, that time and race to do a lot today. Get to sleep today. It's more easy. I'm going to sleep easier tonight. Okay, good. And um, I would to the, to go back to the big picture before I before I maybe open it up to, to questions for the room. And um, the fantastic things about some of the startup and scale up companies that we've got. And then I had a problem and a solution. I met taking up to market. Can you talk about the most significant challenges that you see? Um, in implementing, adopting, delivering sustainable practices. Um, and just in case that feels really negative, it's all about challenges. What do you see as the biggest opportunities as well? Um, so I'll throw that up into any of you because there's different sectors of how from operational. So you see that a lot in the construction sector. You may have to spend a little bit of money today, but over the 60 year life cycle of your building, which is how long buildings should be lasting for, you're going to save uh, a far greater amount. Uh, the challenge is somewhat difficult sometimes for uh, for clients and developers to understand, especially if someone's developing a building to lease it. Perhaps this is a challenging question. But it's also a huge opportunity as well. It's the same opportunity as a challenge. There's two states at the same point. There is this opportunity because if that story can be told accurately again, we're banging the drum about information and data, but this is the realm that we're in. What we measure is what matters. If you can get the evidence, this presentation earlier about having evidence that can give, um, they can tell the story and can make it clear what the benefits are, then those conversations can actually become quite easier. And if those conversations become easier, we will surely get uh, closer towards our goals because this is a life cycle question. This is short term immediate actions for long term gains. There's so many analogies I can use. I do ultra marathons, it's the same thing. You've got to put the effort in now, you'll get the benefit in 12, 24, 36 months. Um, a little bit of a mindset shift. So it's the same challenge and opportunities to say it's Bitcoin. Yeah, that's my input from the ultra marathon mentality. Ultra marathon mentality, that's all we need, and we should surely succeed. Yeah. Um, and the things, businesses here that they've come to COP because it's a bit of you know, we're showcasing them themselves for a while, but also they are so keen to see business in the UAE that can see this sort of opportunity, you know, gateways into the wider Gulf as well. And can we ask a couple of tips, advice for businesses who are breaking into this market? How have you found it? What would your advice be? How how best work with our partners in the UAE? This is the, any, anyone who, who fancies it. I think being the local company, it's really, uh... I think uh, education is very important. Any technology that needs to be introduced or new practices uh, that needs to be introduced needs to be uh, enrolled in a way uh, through the school students, communities, residents, so that they accept it and uh, make it part of their lifestyle. It's difficult to impose a new regime or new technology and it's able to just to you know, fun with it. So. Education is very important, and at those school, we really, really work hard on educating uh, the new generation and our customers as well. Very good with that. And the employees as well are coming 100% local departments or local departments, the local departments, the traditional of this culture, of this country. And since I'm, I'm living here, I've seen a lot of things, and I'm really happy to, to work. With, with people on the ground, especially, I was mentioning that the farmers, it's, it's quite interesting because time by time it's changing and the, the global, the, the climate change is really, is really here. So we can see it 
regarding as well the water, the water source itself, the salinity, and I'm, I'm really happy to, to have this direct contact. So this is very important for you guys to, to have someone uh, here as a partner locally to, to help you out. Fantastic. Right, we're going to throw it open to the audience still. So please don't be shy. Uh, feel free to ask any questions of our panelists or of the companies that were presenting earlier. Um, we're going to hold the silence uh, until someone's braver to put their hand up. And uh, for the extroverts in the room, at some point we'll become really equipped. For the introverts, they'll be very comfortable in the silence, just sitting there and relax and have their own moment. The extroverts, at some point, they'll be over. Uh, but yeah, any questions, sir? Um, God, like, oh, just, you just introduce uh, who you are here, you know, just who you are, wait. Sounds like uh, the so David okay. Stops and the Richie of um, Thank you, all of you, for, for appearing with and all the presenters. Um, Paul, you talked about the regulatory framework. Um, but should we use to accelerate um, you know, the ambitions of what you're doing about building, building code, sort of moving around farming, uh, with those you know, right, well, um, what do you think needs to change and how can the industry collaborate to help that change to, to make action quicker, more impactful? It's a great question. Uh, there was a discussion yesterday at the Global Leaders Summit um, about this, and we thought about it. Uh, building codes, but globally, have not really been changed since uh, we're going into the, 19, uh, into the 1960s and what happened is building codes have been added on to indices, annexes, annexes, annexes. And where we're at it now is a very complex scenario where you could actually see that new buildings have uh, meat code because the codes are so complex. The codes are just so complex. So what like, needs to happen is the codes actually need to be rewritten. Now in 2023, a lot, a lot has changed in 60 years, technology's changed, engineering's changed, design's changed. So we do need a revision to, to building codes. So we need them simpler. So we need two things. We need them simpler and we need them more stringent. That might seem counterintuitive, but for the two do work together. We need them more stringent because we need to be telling us that a new development should achieve a certain energy intensity. That's just the way it should be currently. It's a little bit loose, it's left open to the developers who are leading the way, are leading the way. But they're actually now complaining that they're at a commercial uh, disadvantage because they're pushing the agenda. Maybe it costs them a little bit more, but no one else has to really push the agenda. They can still go with the status quo and things can still, still be built and things can still happen. So more stringency, more stringency has to be applied. Um, another good quote, again, I'm, I'm Leveraging some some uh, expertise from others, what I got yesterday, a quote from Charlie Munger it says, "Show the incentives and show the outcome." So, how do we incentivize top class uh, sustainable developments? And that will cover ways. That will cover recycling. It's not just an energy story. It's a, it's a whole circular economy story. So, big ask. We need to revise the codes and we need to push ourselves harder to, to achieve more. Uh, one thing that we can do as industry, we can lobby for that. We can speak to. DM, we can speak to our Dhabi municipality, we can, why not? We can band together and try and change change things or, or push the agenda. It's built environments day, day to day at COP28, so it you was know, maybe there's something, there's something cooking and some announcement will come that will guide us all in our next steps. Absolutely, sure that I think it's supposed to be the Nilgram, but reveals so far this week so you haven't known something out of something that's uh free kick comes to any other but it's brilliant please fill it in thank you i want to have to this from dubai sand spark now the uae has embarked on a journey to go to net zero and that would obviously mean lots of things uh green building recycling what kind of uh, talent does the uae need to have to be able to you know, support this certain, do we need more engineers, do we need more, you know, what kind of talent gap, you know, does this need to be addressed and probably uh, fortunate for universities like how you import to address that as well? Big question. Hi, folks, the skills agenda, um, and actually there was a panel this morning that was on the talk about the oil and gas industry and how uh, 
transition to energy chemicals is much driven by the skills agenda as anything else because they cannot get power without setting out a future path for people who want to work in uh, going forward. So I think this is really top. So um, who will also pick up uh, the skills that each for the future and how the institutions can support? Oh, becoming net zero or carbon negative is something we need to think about a mindset change or something like championing a mindset change. So this is education. This is like um, being open to, for example, ways to value all these things, um, which can actually gain value as well knowledge. So I think we should work with the universities, with the schools, and show the younger people and the younger generations what we can actually do. Totally agree. Uh, uh, what I would like to add is that we cannot reduce what we cannot measure. So everybody will start by measuring their carbon footprint so that they know where they're at and how, uh, what's their road to achieve the net zero. Um, everybody's talking about net zero and it seems like off topic now on who's actually doing something about it. That's a big question. At those schools, we started measuring our baseline, and we've done it for 2022. We have a roadmap for 2050, and it's a long journey. Um, but if we work collectively with all the sectors, uh, we can get there, but we have to measure. Otherwise, can no chance. And there's, there's companies, partners, it's sounds experienced, uh, Peter C. Steve, when you've got a third pipeline that you need, a lot of people are arriving with the right skills, and you have to work very hard with uh, the fee stock that you get to turn, not waste the money, but to kind of sell that into gold. So, uh, uh, yeah, I know, I was looking in the market for, uh, we do some lead certification work, um, and a lot of lead OM buildings, so getting into existing buildings, uh, we're, Baseline their energy waste, um, carbon performance, and their air quality. Telling clients that there are certain level, use some improvement marks, and here's where you can get to perhaps lead gold or lead plants. And this building here is lead gold, um, very great achievement. So, go to the market. I speak to some industry colleagues, and it seems that talent that can do that type of activity um, are kind of moving away from that type of activity and moving into the strategy space and the advisory space. So there's a, there's a movement into other parts of, of the industry, which is important. However, this is the call of action, hashtag actionism, I think <laughs> is the one that we have. We have work to do, so we actually need to bring some of these people back and show the value of actually doing the stuff that we need to do. Because, again, back to COP28, we can't just keep talking about what we need to be doing. 1.5 becomes 2 degrees, becomes 2.5, becomes 3 degrees. We have to do the work, so how do we get the value back? I haven't quite got the answer to that, but I will continue telling it's a fantastic place to be, so please come and work with us. We've never got a job, got a job at all, you know, everything. <laughs> right now we've got another question at the back. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, back to the panelists. Um, again, think about circular economy. Uh, I think something that's really galvanized, certainly Europe, around increasing recycle rates to be the legislative framework around certain set targets for recycled content and products, uh, taxing all virtual material, particularly in case of patenting. Um, where do you think the UAE uh, could really push forward to, to kind of provide that kind of framework to allow recycling to flourish? You know, recycling can only happen if all the way down the value chain uh, there's some, some value to be extracted from it. And that's usually by setting targets, you know, in the products or requirements for using recycled materials. Is the UAE kind of got a, a good kind of pathway to, to join, I guess, more Western markets around, you know, those, kind of, uh, those less requirements? Good question. So, um, one thing would be amazing. I mean, like it is amazing because we are doing it. Um, we have a bio SAP, a biodegradable superabsorbent bond event, which is something like a bioplastic. So you just throw it away and it's degrading. So it's biodegradable, zero microplastic or nanoplastic. 
And I think that we should go into this direction using materials which are biodegradable somehow in this case. So this is from my side because we have this technology and we produced it. So, yes. Um, I think the legislations are very important for both producers and consumers. So, um, the Bahia municipality and the UAE started introduction of the land fees, so it used to be virtually free, disclosing waste at the so everybody would really throw everything and send it to the With the introduction of the land fees, we've seen some changes in the mentality. And we're working closely with the Bahia municipality on developing a new strategy now, revised and fresh one, that includes all the aspects of uh, circular economy. We're hoping if this comes in place and gets implemented, uh, things will uh, move faster and change towards a more sustainable uh, uh, waste management plan in the start of the world. Uh, there's a lot of front to be done, and sadly, it's not a one-man show, so one waste management company cannot influence that. It has to be a collective effort, spam, public, and robot. I appreciate Thank you very much. And I think we saw in, in Scotland, in the UK, the number of escalating tax created a value street. So I think the interesting role for regulation doesn't necessarily just have to be uh, a cost or a burden. It can create value streams, for instance. I think it's really important to regulate themselves as value creators as well. Um, folks, have we got any more questions? Yes, really, there's one at the back. Uh, the questions for Joel, you... You make the point that to get any outcome, we need to measure things, and that you've done, sorry, Togas was in the way here, so click. <laughs> we need to measure it to get any change. Okay, that's a pretty straightforward thing that we all get up here. You said you've done your baselining activity, and lots of large organisations going through that now in terms of the scope one, two, three obligations that they have. Uh, I'm interested in the number of data companies in here and sense companies. Have you identified any shortfalls in the data that you need to be able to deliver that verification that you require? Great question. Um, when we started measuring our carbon uh, footprint, we started focusing on scope one and two, like every company does, and then we started in including scope three. And as we started looking at scope three, we started seeing the gaps because this includes all the supply chain that we are involved in and our suppliers are involved in and our customers are involved in and traceability is not there yet. So I could go to supplier X and ask him for information, whether this information is accurate or not, I cannot verify that. So third party verifications come in place, but again, it's still a uh, work in progress. So measuring scope three, uh, in my opinion, is uh, the biggest uh, challenge um, covering all its aspects in the right and that tour tour. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Uh, folks, I'm going to come to the panel now for their final kind of concluding remarks and we're going to kind of hashtag axed actionism. Um, <laughs> shout actionism, let's all get tattooed quickly. Uh, in ringing in our beers. Uh, I just wanted to um, ask you for your final reaction. So, your, your call to action, your, what do you want to see uh, that, and how, how we can achieve that. So I'll, I'll come to you with that, just your final reflections or remarks. But just before I do that, and then I'll leave a little bit of time for us to do some networking uh, through in the uh, the other room, which is Correct. Yeah. down there yeah. on yeah. the left. Get some coffee, uh, coffee yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, dates to keep keep yourselves fortified. Um, uh, but there's just before we go to the final comments from about any other final questions, uh, don't die wondering. Uh, fantastic. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, who wants to give us their final final remarks? Hashtag fetishism. Uh, they keep me putting. Thank you about what's going on. Oh, there is a final question. Or it is. Sorry. I actually think you're about to answer the question I was going to ask. It's around the, what each of the panel members what one action to come out of COP28. Would you be willing to That's brilliant. That's what you're about to answer. Okay, fantastic. Uh, who will spit first? So. This was, um. I think, back to the topic of today, innovation and technology, for us to be able in the waste sector to implement the technology, we need, as I said, collaboration. So 
we will not start celebrating at source. That's not all for action today. We all get either, or not all, most of us get lazy and think we cannot recycle. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't know where to where to take our rail. So um, there are solutions. We can do something with you. There are a lot of options. Ask the questions. And I think uh, this is the key message for today. So simulation from one side so that technologies are effective. And to give you a question, um, I hope from COP28 we get new policies that are um, in favor of uh, reducing carbon footprint of all sectors within the EU. Yeah, for me, it's, it's about carbon. You mentioned earlier, um, science based targets, there's a carbon budget. So I'd like to see um, some mandate all new projects have to have a have to have a life cycle carbon analysis. Currently, is that choice. If you go to the lead, if you go to S Dama, if you go to the uh, Green Million, you can choose to do this. I think we should be mandated. And then we can figure out how we use all that information. But at the very least, we need to start uh, collecting all that data. For me, it's the One Health strategy. So, I don't know if you're aware of the One Health strategy, but it's about healthy soil, making healthy plants, making healthy human being or animals in a, a healthy environment. So this is very important to stick and to actually connect science with technology and, and creative people so we can manage these targets and goals. And yes, I'm, I'm quite sure that we can do this, but we need to stick together. I said where I think so, all that news of that optimism uh, and we, we've got to sort it uh, merge it and then we'll get to a healthier planet early. so that's a fantastic and I for us to finish on uh, huge thanks to our panelists and to all of the companies that presented today uh, there is some really good connections to be made from folks in the room so we'd really appreciate uh, everyone heading on down uh, grabbing a cuppa and making those connections um, and just say huge thank you to Joel Paul and Enzo, so we're going to have to dash type of the panelists. Thank you so much for it. <laughs>